Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to John Titus. He is the filmmaker behind All the Plenary's Men, available on the web. John, welcome. Thank you, Max. Good to be here. I want to just mention an opening statement here in the film and then break it down for us. It says, and you point out here, uh, this is from the transcript of the film, uh, when you don't see the, the hard evidence that you're missing is that cabinet members carried out treasonous orders from overseas to help a criminal cartel wage an all-out war on Americans. Of course, this refers back to the um, HSBC 2012 incident. So let's break this down. Give us a broad, just a quick, dirty, dirty, down and dirty, what's the big event here? The big event is the wake of HSBC, which had admitted to laundering money for drug dealers and terrorists. And what we knew in 2012 was they had admitted that and nobody went to jail. And the question is why? And in 2016, Republican members of the House Financial Services Committee released a report and we learned new information then. And one of the big things we learned was that the Justice Department had actually planned to prosecute HSBC, but that it reversed itself. And the reason it reversed itself was that George Osborne, who was at that time Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK, had sent a letter to Tim Geithner and to Ben Bernanke. And he said, basically, back off. And then from that point on, Eric Holder, who was the Attorney General at the time, basically backed down, and not only backed down, but then entered into, ultimately, a deferred prosecution agreement in which any number of immunities were granted to HSBC. And those immunities are quite serious because even the sit sitting president of the United States legally does not enjoy the immunities that HSBC was granted in a deferred prosecution agreement. This is incredibly important that during these days of terrorism and the rise of terrorism, especially in the United Kingdom and in London, where folks are asking themselves, why do we have all this terrorist activity suddenly? And there's a direct link to the banks. And there's a direct link to HSBC because they were directly involved in financing terrorism. And yet, the letter that you refer to, here it is, here's a copy, it's available online. Uh, it's dated uh, September 10th of 2012. It's to Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve System. It's from George. Osborne, and you break down this letter. You have background in the law. Correct. I've been a federal litigator for over 20 years. And you know how to suss out the legalese, and you point out in particular a phrase in here that the way it's described in the film was, uh, you know, you could smell the powdered wig from here. You know, this was a senior legal barrister coming in and crafting some of this language. Uh, can you just touch on this briefly? Sure. The, the letter is, it sounds like Osborne for multiple paragraphs. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the letter, there appear two very, very curious statements. And the reason they're curious is that they are loaded with legalese that would not necessarily be obvious to a layperson. But the real red flag in those two sentences is the second sentence where Osborne supposedly says to Bernanke and to Geithner, it's our job, meaning the UK financial officials, George Osborne, Mervyn King, and Adair Turner to enforce global standards and rules. And that's a huge red flag because that is not their job. Their job is to enforce UK rules, in other words, British law, and their job is to enforce European Commission law. But by no stretch of the imagination, do UK financial officials go around enforcing global standards and rules? And so the question then becomes, what global standards and rules is he talking about? Because whatever they are, that's why HSBC got reversed by Eric Holder. Okay, so there's three players. There's America, there's Britain, then there's this other entity that we're going to touch on in a second here. So HSBC was got prosecuted, was about to get prosecuted in America for massive money laundering, massive drug money laundering, caused tens of thousands of deaths. Uh, Attorney General Eric Holder at the time, uh, neck deep in this transgression, if you will, of all standards of decency and law. Then you have, of course, the George Osborne, the exchequer of the exchange in Britain, where HSBC is effectively domiciled, it's a British bank, writing this letter to American Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke. And as you point out in the language of this letter, it, it, it goes from saying we over here in Britain are really concerned about this because this is a multi-billion, hundred, you know, it's a trillion. That's a, it's a, ultimately a multi-billion dollar fine. And um, then he brings in this language suggesting there's a third party. There's a third party at work here. And this is what people have to understand. Why do these banks keep getting given these immunities? Why is there so much financial fraud around the world? Why is there no accountability? Why do bankers not go to jail? Because of this third party, which, talk about this. Okay, so 
the, the two sentences, I refer to the second one, which is we enforce global standards and rules. The first sentence says to Bernanke and Geithner, it is, of course, it's for you to decide on how to enforce compliance in your jurisdiction. And so, that, again, again, a casual person might say, well, that means U.S. law. Your jurisdiction means in the U.S. It doesn't. Those are loaded legal terms. And what he is doing, Osborne, is leading Bernanke and Geithner. He is signaling them to look at global standards and rules. And the way you get to that is if you look at Bernanke and Geithner on the American side, and you look at Mervyn King, Adair Turner, and George Osborne on the British side, all five are members of a group called the Financial Stability Board in the Bank for International Settlements the in FSB Basel, Switzerland. The FSB is part of the BIS in Switzerland. Correct. The FSB has some interesting members. It's got Mark Carney, for example. Correct. He was, he's the chairman of the FSB. He was then and he is to this day. And they do the bidding of the folks that effectively are crafting law that bypasses the sovereignty of Britain and America, correct? It supersedes the sovereignty. In other words, the, the Financial Stability Board released in late 2011 a list of banks called Systemically Important Financial Institutions, SIFIs. HSBC is on this list of people, list of banks. Standard Charter was not. Standard Charter was not. They on got that tagged bank. for a big fine. Well, Standard Charter, the, the, the distinction between Standard Charter on the one hand and HSBC on the other is that in the Department of Justice, while the investigation is going on and while the prosecutors are planning to go after HSBC, members of British financial services people are inside the internal DOJ meetings. What are they doing inside internal DOJ meetings? Those meetings should be closed to foreigners. Sorry. And in fact, they were closed in the, in the standard charter case. And the only reason that one would be that the British people were allowed in the HSBC meetings on the one hand, but not in the, as the standard charter meetings on the other hand, is that Standard Charter Bank wasn't a G fifty? It's not part of the FSB's cartel. At least it wasn't in late two thousand and eleven. Right. It wasn't at that time. They got tagged. Uh, HSBC was, and as you point out, they are. It's a protection racket essentially run by the Financial Stability Board and the Bank of International Settlements out of Switzerland. And these uh, cartel member banks are immune from massive fraud. And um, th this is quite clear in this smoking gun letter. You say in the film that on this date in 2012 is the date America dies. I don't think I quite said that. No? I think the day America died was October 3rd, 2008, but anyway. The, uh, but the sentiment there is effectively, my point is that, and I paraphrase, uh, my point is that you've got um, a supernatural organization that is running roughshod over all these individual countries to protect these banks. Correct. In other words, there are immunities that, were, in other words, global standards and rules refers to immunities within the Bank for International Settlements. And they're written out. And those immunities have been in place for the BIS to protect BIS officials. And they've been in place for decades. But now they've been improperly extended to the SIFIs. And that's the problem. And you can look at case by case by case including HSBC, including cases after HSBC, where those SIPIs enjoy immunities in that agreement. That, that agreement is not American law at all. Why are these immunities being enforced? Right. And so what the film shows, for example, is that the DOJ doesn't really have subpoena power over the SIPIs. The, the, the SIPIs can pick and choose what documents disclose to disclose to the, to the Justice Department on the one hand, but even the sitting president can't do that, which we know from the Nixon episode. Nixon tried to pick and choose his documents, and he was shot down by the Supreme Court. So explain to me why it is that these criminal, bank, these criminal banks in the cartel can pick and choose what to disclose in the way of documents to the DOJ. Right. And, and, and the DOJ frankly admits this flat out. Sally Yates admitted this flat out in September of 2015. Yeah. They're allowed to pick and choose what documents is close. So the immunities we're talking about are, there's a few, a few. There's a few. Okay. One immunity is the immunity of banks as corporations. That's number one. Number two is immunity of bank officials. In other words, people working in the bank, so long as they're doing the official business of the bank in question, those people are immune. They're immune from prosecution. The third immunity is immunity of documents. In other words, 
the Justice Department just can't reach in like it would to a normal criminal defendant and flip the company over and go through every document. They can't do that. They can only get whatever documents the banks choose to disclose. And the fourth immunity is immunity of assets. And you say, well, HSBC was fined $1.92 billion as the film shows. That wasn't a fine at all. That was not a fine. It was negotiated by HSBC, and it was, it was lower than the fine should have been because they just choose whatever they want to to disclose to the, bank, to the DOJ. Right, and they, of course, it was a, just the whole idea of a deferred prosecution in itself sounds ludicrous um, in terms of any kind of legal standard, it, right? Is, well, have you ever seen in cases of recidivism where a bank goes back and commits crimes again, like HSBC or like UBS, have you ever seen a deferred prosecution torn up and people prosecuted? No. It's just a way to kick the can down the road and placate the public. Again, the, the, the magnitude of this is quite stunning because these, this bank was caught laundering money for terrorists, saying so drug money, you know, uh, launderers. And, uh, and they are repeat offenders, as you point out. They, just, they, they never seem to get the point that maybe they should stop being criminals. And it spreads throughout the entire industry. Um, you know, every single bank now looks to them and say, you know, we want to be, grow up and be like HSBC, where we have immunity from the law, we can launder money at will, we have no uh, accountability, and that's our goal in life, and we want to pay ourselves huge bonuses. So, but I, I, obviously, with this, it's amazing, maybe comment briefly on this, is that here you have a, a territory, London, and the city of London, which is host to predatory financial terrorists. And now, you know, Aramco, Saudi Arabia, they're going to float a multi-billion you know, billion dollar offering at offer the value of the company $2 trillion for the, the Wahhabists in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, and they're going to float it through London. It's not like a slap in the face to the victims of the London bomb terrorism, the Westminster bomb terrorism, the Manchester terrorism. I mean, here's all the evidence right here. Here's the report. It's all available online. You can download this stuff online. I mean, this is a direct link. I mean, isn't it kind of like, you know, not to be inelegant, but peeing in the face of the victims? It's, it's way worse than that. It's way worse because if you look at the power that the, that the cartel banks now have, William Blackstone was the one who came along in 1765, and in the commentaries of England, he said, the king can do no wrong. And by that, he doesn't mean, as a matter of fact, the king can do no wrong. He's simply saying, this is a statement of complete power of a monarch. It's plenary power of a monarch. And the banks now enjoy that power. They can do no wrong. Literally, they can do no wrong. They can commit crimes with total impunity, which gives them, it makes them legally more powerful than the government. So in other words, the sovereign in the U.S. is supposed to be we the people. First three words in the Constitution, right? It's not we the people. The sovereign authority in the U.S., the sovereign power of the U.S. is a criminal global banking cartel, period, full stop. So we got to cut it off there. Thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you. All right, that's been the show. Thanks for watching. I'm Max Kaiser. My guest today was uh, John Titus. He's the filmmaker behind all the plenaries men available online. If you want to reach us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.